All right. Uh, so uh, we are pleased to announce this week's uh, ICT string seminar. Uh, Tim Madamo is going to talk about talk about uh, twisted theory and infinite dimensional soft symmetries. Tim, Tim is from University University of Edinburgh. Over to you, Tim. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah. And so it's a it's a great pleasure to uh, to be in uh, Bengaluru, a place I've uh, visited twice before and had. Uh, uh, I have lovely, lovely memories of and hope, uh, hope to get back to you sometime. Um, so today I'm going to tell you a, a story that's primarily based on uh, a paper with Lionel Mason and Atul Sharma, who's actually uh, sort of a, a hometown hero for you guys. Uh, I think he did his undergrad uh, at, uh, at ICTS. Um, but it's also sort of related to another paper uh, with Atul and then Wei Bu, who's a graduate student here in uh, Edinburgh. Eduardo Casali, who's a postdoc in, in Harvard. So I'll mainly be talking about this first paper today, but it has some kind of natural overlap uh, with the second one that I'll comment on. So uh, the other thing I should say straight away is that I can't see you all. So if you have questions while I'm talking, just interrupt me. Uh, and so the, 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 the more questions, uh, the better. Uh, the point is to understand something. Uh, okay, so uh, without further ado, uh, let's take it away. So um, I'll start with a bit of kind of qualitative uh, motivation. So it may be that lots of you in the, the audience are very familiar with these things, but if you're not, you may have heard uh, these, these words celestial holography being thrown around a lot in recent years. Um, this is becoming uh, a bigger topic, uh, but what is, it, what is it actually about? I mean, this is some sort of very tempting uh, nomenclature. Well, the pipe dream for this field <laughs> Uh, is that there exists some, some sort of conformal field theory uh, living on the celestial sphere. And by that, I mean the, the so if we're in D dimensions, that's the D minus two sphere uh, of null directions uh, in that number of dimensions. We're, we're gonna be living in four dimensions for the purposes of our talk, uh, the talk today, but uh, there, there exists some conformal field theory living on this celestial sphere, sphere such that correlation functions of some operators <coughs> in this uh, CFT compute for you uh, S matrix elements in asymptotically flat space times, in particular massless uh, S matrix elements. So in other words, the pipe dream for what this, this area of celestial holography is about is that it's, it's some sort of asymptotically flat holography. Now I call it a pipe dream because uh, I think it's fair to say that um, there's not really any uh, smoking gun uh, that I, for me, this is my personal opinion, there's no smoking gun to indicate that this pipe dream is actually true yet. Um, so, so what's all the noise about? Well, um, uh, in, in fact, the foundations of this idea or this pipe dream are actually just completely kinematical and, and very easy to explain. So, so that's where I'd like to start is just explaining what, what, what's really behind this, this notion of celestial holography. So uh, let's say we're in four dimensions and we want to talk about scattering of massless particles. So usually we talk about this in terms of a momentum eigenstate representation. So if I want to parameterize a massless four momentum, I can do that by specifying a frequency or energy, let me call that omega, and then a point on the celestial sphere. So if you like, that's just <coughs> specifying a null direction and a scale. And then I can write my four momentum in terms of that scale or frequency, and this point on the celestial sphere. So here I'll be thinking of the celestial sphere as the Riemann sphere or the one dimensional complex projective space. That means I can describe it with homogeneous coordinates, say Z alpha, uh, which are holomorphic and Z bar alpha dot, which are alpha holom which are anti-holomorphic. These indices are SL2 bile spinner indices. So they're two components. So alpha say runs from zero to one, alpha dot runs from zero dot to one dot. And these are considered up to overall rescalings by non-vanishing complex numbers. So it's really just a one-dimensional complex space uh, parameterized. And uh, okay, so then my four momentum, which you might usually think of as some K mu, this gets turned into a two by two matrix uh, with vanishing determinant because it has this uh, composition into spinners. So in any case, that just means that an endpoint massless scattering amplitude, uh, you can think of it as a function of these frequencies and these points on the celestial sphere. So there's nothing There's nothing new there. That's just a, a way of parameterizing mass, massless momenta. And of course, this is also a function of whatever other quantum numbers are relevant for the scattering uh, process. But uh, let's just be agnostic about this for now. So then the, the basic idea 
is to do something which might seem a little bit weird, uh, to do a Mellon transform with respect to all of the frequencies of the particles that we're scattering. <coughs> and we do this specifying some numbers. We replace the dependence on frequency uh, with some numbers, delta. And a priori, these can be any complex numbers uh, you like. And we'll, we'll shove under the rug any concerns you may or may not have about the convergence of these integrals. For now, we're just assume that this is just a formal, uh, a formal statement. So we Mellon transform away the dependence on the frequency and replace it uh, with the dependence on these deltas. The dependence on points on the celestial sphere uh, remains. Now, the key fact is that this object, this formal object we've defined, uh, uh, actually transforms as a conformal correlator on the two on the two sphere, the celestial sphere, and this is just a kinematic fact that you can work through, considering the action of Lorentz transformations in the momentum eigenstate basis, and then carrying that through uh, through the Mellon transform. Um, and so these objects, uh, these kind of if you like Mellon transform scattering amplitudes, they get referred to as celestial amplitudes because just on completely kinematical grounds, they have to transform like conformal correlation functions. On the celestial sphere, with the deltas now playing the role of scaling dimensions um, or conformal dimensions. Now, uh, okay, you might say, well, okay, it's kind of kind of weird. What is what does it really mean physically? Well, well, physically, what this is equivalent to doing is doing your LSZ truncation onto a basis of free fields at infinity, which isn't the usual momentum eigenstate basis, but some alternative on shell uh, basis. Of external states. So uh, this, this basis is all. Yep, please, please. So Z alpha, Z alpha bar, Z alpha bar dot. Those were four coordinates, right? Uh, so so these are actually uh, so they're they're four numbers. Yeah. Uh, considered up to overall rescaling. So actually, they're only two numbers. Okay. Yeah, so so very very good. So usually in the in the sort of literature on this subject, people don't use these homogeneous coordinates, but that's really what they are. These these are the coordinates that don't break Lorentz invariance. Um, you could go to a patch and then just talk about a z and a z bar as complex numbers, um, but that's of course not global on the sphere. Um, you miss a point at infinity. Does that answer your question? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, Right, okay, so so my claim is that doing this Mellon transform, the scattering amplitude, but well, not my claim, the claim is that doing this Mellon transform to the scattering amplitude is really equivalent to just computing the scattering amplitude in a different basis uh, of external states. And that basis uh, gets called uh, the conformal primary basis uh, with good reason. It's a basis that makes free fields uh, transform like conformal primaries of conformal dimension delta and appropriate spin, the spin just being the spin of the space-time field, uh, on the celestial sphere. And it turns out that this, this basis is gauge equivalent to just Mellon transforming the, the usual momentum eigenstate basis. Um, by gauge equivalent, I mean up to linearized uh, gauge transformations of the external fields. Um, so let's do an example, the universal example for the purposes of our discussions today, which would just be a positive helicity graviton in four dimensions. So, okay, we're in four dimensions. That means that this thing has two symmetric vector or uh, variant indices downstairs in this sort of cell two spinner notation that gets replaced. Every vector index gets replaced by a pair of SL2C spinner indices of opposite chirality. So we have alpha, alpha dot and beta, beta dot. This thing is going to get labeled by a delta, which I'll make explicit, but there are other quantum numbers, of course. Um, so there's some prefactor we have, which is basically just set by whether we consider this graviton to be incoming or outgoing. And there's a gamma function. Then you have a numerator, where part of the numerator depends on the anti-holomorphic insertion point on the celestial sphere that kind of parameterizes the state. And there's some gauge, residual gauge information. So you have some constant spinners that I've called iota. Um, and basically, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what these are. You can show that it would drop out of the linearized field strength. If you, if you computed the linearized field strength of this metric perturbation, it will not depend on iota. And then you have a denominator uh, that is raised to the power of delta. It's just the spinner contractions between the point 
the celestial sphere and the point space time uh, where your perturbation is living. So you can show, uh, this is just a calculation you can amuse yourself with, throw this guy into the linearized Einstein equations and you'll see that it solves the equations for any value of delta. So delta can be any complex number, but uh, what Pastersky and Shao showed was that these guys actually form a complete normalizable basis of solutions uh, on this principal continuous series where delta is equal to one plus any uh, imaginary number. Um, you know, the whole. Another question. Please. So, uh, do the iota alphas, iota betas, do they incorporate the fact that uh, the z's are actually scaled uh, by some factor? Uh, how, how very, very good question. So, okay, you're 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 already uh, being uh, too smart. Uh, no, so, so, so in a good way, yeah. So, so absolutely, they do. So, you might worry if you looked at this expression. It looks like it carries some homogeneity in these iotas. It looks like it's homogeneity weight two in iota. And in fact, I've made the thing is there's I told you these iotas uh, don't uh, they can be whatever you want. So in principle, I've already made an implicit choice here, which is that spinner contraction between iota and Z I've set equal to one. So in point of fact, if I was being completely honest, there should be another factor in the denominator, which would be angle bracket Z iota squared. That would completely account for, uh, explicitly account for the scaling weights that, that you're worried about. But I've I've implicitly uh, chosen iota, normalized iota, so that its contraction with Z is, is equal to one. And that's something you can always do. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. It does take into account scaling. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Cool, okay, yeah, very, very, yeah, yeah. keeping me honest. Yes, so, so there's some residual gauge freedom, which I've actually partially fixed already by writing writing this expression this way. Okay, cool. So um, what you can show is that uh, for some special values of delta, uh, these free fields uh, do interesting things. So for instance, when delta is equal to one or zero, you can show that this positive helicity graviton is actually pure gauge or pure linearized diffeomorphism. <laughs> and it's easy to show that this in some sense, it's just the Mellon transform of the usual leading and subleading soft graviton theorems in momentum space, but it leads to some new kind of uh, factorization behavior in this conformal primary basis. So, for example, if we just take the delta going to one limit, I'll take an n plus one point amplitude, uh, say graviton amplitude, where I have n these uh, conformal primary gravitons that I'm not going to mess with, and then one more where I'm going to scale this scaling dimension. Let me say that it's outgoing, so this plus superscript stands for. I'm going to send it to one. You can show that the amplitude will take this kind of universal form where it has a pole in the soft uh, scaling dimension, and then you just sum over pinpoint amplitudes where the ith assertions uh, their conformal dimensions shifted by one. That's what this notation is, is meant to say. And the prefactor is just something that depends on whether ith state is incoming or outgoing. Then differences, uh, the anti-holomorphic and holomorphic differences in insertion points between the ith state and the soft state on the celestial sphere. So my notation here, z bar i s, that just means z bar i minus z bar s in the affine patch. Or if you want to think in, uh, in the homogeneous co coordinates, it would be square bracket z bar i z bar s. And similarly, z i s would be angle bracket z i z s or z i minus z h s in the affine patch. So there's a similar, uh, slightly more complicated uh, subleading conformal soft graviton theorem you can write down uh, for delta equals zero as well, which again, you could think of as sort of being the Mellon transform of the subleading soft graviton theorem in the momentum eigenstate basis. Okay, so that's uh, that's that's all nice. But actually, you remember when I wrote down that wave function for the positive helicity graviton, there was this gamma function of delta sitting out in front of everything. And you know that this guy goes up at negative integer values. So something singular must also be happening uh, for an infinite, a countably infinite set of scaling weights when, in particular, when uh, scaling dimensions, when delta is equal to any negative integer. And it turns out, um, and I think Alfredo Guevara was the first person to really appreciate this, that um, this is just the conformal primary version 
of all the higher order terms you would get in the energetic soft expansion. So if you, again, you imagine you had some frequency omega and you were doing a frequency, uh, an expansion in kind of a uh, small omega, a small omega expansion of your amplitude, you don't need to stop at leading or subleading order. There's just an infinite, uh, an infinite tower uh, that you, uh, infinite tower of soft expand, energetic soft expansions you can consider. And this infinite tower of singularities um, is the conformal primary basis version of that statement. So what's, okay, so, so that, that might not sound so surprising, but what is surprising is that this infinite tower of positive, positive helicity conformally soft gravitons forms an algebra. So uh, an algebra under the operator product expansion on the celestial sphere. And this operator product expansion, again, this doesn't actually invoke necessarily the existence of a dynamical CFT on the celestial sphere. It's just something that you could get by Mellon transforming collinear limits um, in momentum space. So if, if I have two uh, uh, null vectors, Four, four dimensional null vectors and I take their collinear limit, that just means that the points on the celestial sphere, which parameterize these guys are colliding. So it's like an OPE limit, if you want to, uh, on the celestial sphere, if you want to think in those terms. You can show that the infinite family of conformally soft gravitons uh, forms some sort of gnarly looking algebra uh, under this. So this was pointed out by a uh, Alfredo, uh, Mina Himwick, Monica Pate, and, and Strominger a few years ago, a couple years ago, three years ago now, time flies. Anyway, uh, so, so that's already kind of a, a bit surprising. Uh, what seems to be very surprising is that this isn't just any algebra, this is a well-known algebra, uh, or at least uh, well-known in certain circles. Um, the, the key claim is that this algebra of positive helicity conformally soft gravitons is an algebra known as little w one plus infinity. So it's completely unimportant that you know what, or have any idea what this uh, notation little w one plus infinity means. What it means in real money is that you have some generators of the algebra, which are in indexed by two numbers, p and m. This p is like, it's basically related to the conformal dimension. Uh, so remember these, these soft, positive helicity soft gravitons correspond to delta being equal to one, zero, minus one, minus two, all, uh, all the way through the, the negative integers. So in some sense, that gets translated into this P. And then the other kind of quantum number N, M, this is related to kind of the anti-holomorphic SL2 weight. So it's like you've taken your mode and you've done an expansion in Z bar, uh, the anti-holomorphic coordinate on the celestial sphere. And then what W1 plus infinity is, is just defined by this commutation relation here. So uh, what Strominger did in real money, was he took this observation, the, the bigger group had, he realized that if you rearranged uh, the modes in that algebra, you could show that it was equivalent uh, to this commutator, to the, to the W1 plus infinity commutator. So um, why, why are people excited by this? So first of all, it says that there's some, what it's saying is that there's some infinite dimensional symmetry algebra associated with the self dual sector of gravity that uh, certainly in the amplitudes community, no one seems to have been aware of uh, before. Um, and this, this algebra, and again, it's not important that you internalize this, but this is part of why people are excited about this, I think, that this little w one plus infinity algebra is the classical limit, of some other algebra, which gets called W one plus infinity, which is really like an infinite dimensional higher spin symmetry algebra in 2D CFTs. So I think for a lot of people, the fact that you're finding this little W one plus infinity, the self dual sector raises the hope that actually maybe there's this kind of uh, quantum mechanical higher spin symmetry associated with <coughs> maybe not just the self dual sector, but, but, but full, full gravity, and it would be associated again to some dynamical CFT that lived on the, uh, on the uh, celestial Excuse system. me, uh, excuse me, there are no central extensions in this uh, algebra. You know, the analog of uh, Virasoro. Uh, oh, um, anomaly. Ah. sorry, go ahead. 
again, in Virasoro, you have the classical al algebra, but then mm -hmm. you have the C, the central extension. Mm -hmm. And the same is true in the W algebras in uh, conformal field theory in two dimensions. So my question is, this algebra, the celestial algebra, does it have central extensions or doesn't? No, I don't think it does. That, that's, and that's because you've taken this classical limit, essentially. So it's still infinite dimensional. Yeah, but you don't, you don't the central extensions are the things that are, are up in the kind of quantum, uh, the big W algebras, I believe. Um, but I'm not an expert on these things, so uh, I could be wrong. Okay, thank you. No problem. Um, so in, in kind of following on from that, I mean, so, oh, sorry, was there another question? Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Um, Please. So why do you call it the self-dual sector? Is it because you're only considering positive helicity modes? That's exactly why, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so, okay. so uh, I think this is a useful, um, it's, it's, in some sense, it's, it's tautologically true, but, but maybe not as well. So when we talk about helicity in 4D, what that really means is, the, 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 the duality sign of the linearized curvature associated with the, the, the perturbation. So positive helicity gravitons have purely self-dual linearized curvature tensors. So that's, that's why I'm, yeah, sorry, I should have been much more explicit about that. That's why I'm suddenly going from positive helicity gravitons to self-dual sector uh, of gravity. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks. Yeah, no worries. Okay, so, um, because this little W1 plus infinity is in some sense the completely classical uh, algebra, in fact, it was noticed long ago uh, that it has, uh, you, you can characterize it in a way that doesn't have anything to do with taking a classical limit of higher spin symmetry algebras in 2D CFT. You can just think of it as diffeomorphisms of the two plane that preserve uh, a Poisson structure, uh, a non degenerate Poisson structure on that, on that two plane. So this was pointed out by Jens Hoppe and Janus Bacchus many, many moons ago. Um, but this algebra uh, from the kind of celestial holography point of view, you can also derive this algebra um, just using asymptotic symmetries, say in Minkowski space. And you can also, I think in some sense, maybe this is an even more interesting thing is that this, this algebra doesn't just kind of act on itself, like on within kind of these uh, soft, conformally soft uh, positive helicity gravitons. You can also compute its action on hard gravitons. So gravitons whose conformal dimension doesn't take one of these special, special, say negative integer uh, values. Uh, and so this, this, this again was done a, a couple of years ago. Um, okay, this is like some, some cool infinite dimensional symmetry structure associated with self-dual gravity that um, when we were working in a momentum eigenstate basis uh, over the last 20 years, no one seemed to notice. So uh, this, this seems like uh, something nice about celestial holography, or at least working in this conformal primary basis. And anytime you have some infinite dimensional symmetry, you get excited because you hope maybe you could use it to just constrain answers uh, in a way that uh, you, weren't, you weren't able to before. There are some basic questions, uh, which I think it's fair to say kind of haven't been resolved or weren't resolved by this version of the story, um, which is that when Stromager wrote down uh, this, this version of the algebra to make it obvious that it was V1 plus infinity, some choices had to be made for the normalizations of these modes, these WPM modes. And those choices were not at all uh, unique in the way that uh, he was doing the calculation. We're sort of, in some sense, you could argue they were chosen to identify terms in the answer to make sure that the, you got the right commutators. There's now some yoga about this having to do with some light ray transforms, but I'm not really sure I, I understand. I definitely don't understand. And I'm not sure I buy it. Um, also, the derivation here, again, is completely kinematical. There's just, uh, you, can, you can constrain it all just using asymptotic symmetries. And um, yeah, there's not, there's, you don't really see the kind of dynamics of the self-dual sector of gravity entering the game. So there's some basic questions you could still ask, which is, first of all, is there some way of deriving W1 plus infinity from first principles, that is from self-dual gravity? Um, and could you do this dynamically? And then how does it extend away from the self-dual sector uh, or away from just talking about positive helicity uh, uh, gravitons? So uh, 
the, the meat of what I'd like to, to tell you about today is that there, there is a way to answer these questions and it involves something called twister theory. And I'm 100% not gonna assume that you've uh, ever met uh, this subject before. So I'm gonna try to be uh, as gentle as possible uh, in introducing it. So, uh, okay, so that's the kind of old story up to this point. And now I want to tell you uh, what, in some sense, an even older story as, as, you'll, as you'll see. Okay, so, so what is this thing, twister theory? So the, the basic idea, if you learn nothing else from this talk, maybe you can uh, walk away with this uh, moral lesson, is that the, the basic idea behind twister theory is that you want to encode physics in space-time in terms of complex projective geometry in a way that's non-local. So local objects in space-time get translated into non-local objects in this twister theory or this twister space. And this correspondence is supposed to be holomorphic. So you have some notion of holomorphicity because you're doing things in a complex projective space. Uh, so you, in other words, that adjective make, say that something's holomorphic would make sense here. Um, so the warm up, the kind of example uh, one should carry around in one's head always is to consider Minkowski space or really complexified Minkowski space. It doesn't, it doesn't make uh, much of a difference if you wanna put some reality conditions on this. And we'll say that this has coordinates, if you want to work in the complex category, holomorphic coordinates, uh, x alpha alpha dot. <coughs> so it's a two by two matrix that we encode the uh, Minkowski space coordinates in. And then we're going to also, the complex projective geometry we're going to be dealing with is three dimensional complex projective space, CP3. And I can describe that using homogeneous coordinates again, which are four complex numbers considered up to overall rescalings by non-vanishing complex numbers. So really that's uh, covering three dimensions. And I'm just gonna make some notational choice to split uh, these four complex numbers into uh, two two spinners, mu alpha dot and lambda alpha. Then the twister space associated, Minkowski space is then, an open subset of CP3 corresponding to where the, the lambda alpha spinners are non-vanishing. So really you can think of this as removing a complex projective line or removing a CP1 uh, from CP3. Okay, so that's the basic example of a twister space. And the relationship between Minkowski space and this twister space is given by something called the incidence relations. This is just, uh, an algebraic equation relating a point on space-time to these homogeneous coordinates on twister space, what it really means is that if you hand me a point space-time in X, this is the equation for a holomorphic linearly embedded Riemann sphere in CP3 or in the twister space. So that's the sense in which this correspondence is non-local because a point in space-time corresponds to an extended object, a Riemann sphere in the twister space, it's holomorphic in the sense that there are no bars, stars uh, appearing in this equation. Okay, so this is the toy, the, the, the toy example of the twister correspondence. This, this correspondence between Minkowski space and space-time uh, and this twister space in particular has some other natural structures associated with it. So in particular, it has a vibration over the Riemann sphere because we don't we remove from CP3 all the points where both lambda alphas are equal to zero. That means that we can always take a projection from the coordinates on twister space, mu and lambda, lambda, because these will be not non-vanishing, they provide homogeneous coordinates on the Riemann sphere itself. So this, this is what I mean when I say that we, we have this vibration from twister space to the Riemann sphere. And there's also a natural Poisson structure, a natural SL2 invariant Poisson structure on the fibers of, of this vibration, which I'll denote with curly brackets. It's just given by taking derivatives in the mu directions and then contracting indices together with the natural SL2 invariant inner product. So this is just the two-dimensional Levi-Civita uh, symbol uh, on dotted spinner indices, uh, dotted SL2 spinner indices. Okay, so this is in some sense uh, a lightning overview of the, the twister correspondence or twister theory for Minkowski space time. But what about curved space times? Uh, does this story work outside of Minkowski space? Here, the key result uh, goes back to Penrose. Oh, please. Could you go back to the previous slide? So, in this Poisson bracket, 
uh, why don't you have the lambdas? Ah, good. So this is right. So on twister space, this is a degenerate Poisson structure in the sense that it doesn't touch the lambdas. But on, if I want to think of it just as a Poisson structure on the fibers, then um, uh, then 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 it. It's non-degenerate, right? So the, the only coordinates on the fibers of this map are mu mu alpha dot. Um, now you could ask, well, why don't you add a term that's like epsilon alpha beta df by d lambda dg uh, by d lambda, for instance? Um, and you could add such a term, but you can show that that uh, that term is not going to respect really. So now, okay, I'm going to have to tell you things without explaining them in little detail, but if it's not clear, ask me and I can try and be better. If you included such a term, it turns out that you won't get twister space, which has the conformal structure of Minkowski space. You get something that has, it will still be formally flat. But it won't be asymptotically flat. So if you, if you include D by D lambda terms, it's like turning on a cosmological constant for the space time. Now, I've not told you anything that would make it clear why that's true, but really that's why one doesn't add the d by d lambda terms to this. Okay. I'm sorry, it's a really lame answer to, to a good question. No problem. Yeah. We can talk more about it later if, if, if you like. Okay. Um, right, so so what about curved space times? And here the, the, the key result is this thing that gets if you're in the right community, it's called the nonlinear graviton theorem uh, by Penrose, which just tells us that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between self-dual, Ricci flat, or vacuum uh, holomorphic metrics in four dimensions and complex deformations of the Minkowski twister space that we just wrote down, which I'll call sort of E curly T. And these complex deformations have to preserve these two other structures. So they have to preserve the vibration over the Riemann sphere and the Poisson structure on the fibers of that vibration. Plus some other technical assumptions. I mean, in, in particular, uh, some assumptions, that this complex deformation uh, admits a four parameter family of rational curves with normal bundle of a prescribed type. But you can really think of these as like some technical requirements. This is, this is sort of the important part um, of the theorem. Okay, so the upshot, I mean, if, if these words sort of don't mean, aren't, aren't, aren't meaning anything to you, the upshot of this theorem is that twister theory provides a nonlinear description of vacuum self-dual gravity. So that's what these adjectives sort of are meaning up here, Ritchie flat, vacuum, and self-dual. Uh, Tim, uh, I, I had a small question. So uh, this would be the same as a, a saying that the metric is hyperkähler? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and so this, I mean, this is great. You guys are asking all the right questions. So so uh, you asked me before about adding, uh, I was asked before about adding kind of buddy lambda terms uh, to this Poisson structure. And I was saying that, oh, well, that's like turning on a cosmological constant. So there's another version of this theorem, which is self-dual with cosmological constant, right? That like turning on it, Kaler. <laughs> In, in 4D. So there's there's sort of 4K dimensional versions of both of these theorems for quaternionic Kähler and hyper Kähler. Mm -hmm. I've given you the 4D hyper Kähler version here, because that's the, the version that, that we need for, for what we're talking about. Great, thanks. No worries. So Ricci flat is a generalization of uh, constant, uh, cosmological constant uh, manifolds, right? I mean, it, it's, it's more general than those sorts of manifolds. Uh, no, I would say it's more restricted. So Ricci flat means that there's no cosmological constant. No, but uh, okay, but it's not flat in in the sense that uh, it's r mu nu equals zero or something, right? That's exactly what it is. It's r mu nu equals zero. The vial tensor is non-zero, but self-dual. That's what this. Uh, that's what these two uh, qualifiers mean. Yeah. So so my question is whether you would need the lambdas here also. In the Poisson bracket. Ah, no. And the answer is uh, the, the answer, the, it's the Ricci flatness that, that that's why you don't. And that's why you, you preserve the Poisson structure. So in other words, the, the idea is that you can take the coordinates, and we'll see this uh, in, in the coming slides, hopefully. You can take the coordinates mu and lambda we were using on the kind of flat space. 
keep using them on the curved twister space. It's just they won't necessarily be holomorphic coordinates anymore. But the Poisson structure still has to be uh, the one that we wrote here. It still has to be d mu by d mu with no lambdas introduced. If there were lambdas, it wouldn't correspond to the Ricci flat uh, on the other side of the correspondence. Again, I've not shown you anything that would tell you why that was true, but you'll just have to take my word for it uh, uh, for now. But the, mu's okay? are now, but the mu's are now complex or something? There, so, so, um, just, so here on, on the flat twister space, mu and lambda were holomorphic coordinates. But on the curved twister space, I can still use them. They're still complex numbers. They might not be holomorphic with respect to the formed complex structure. Okay. So again, hopefully the coming slides will, will make this a little more clear, but ask me again if it still doesn't make sense um, in, in, in a little while. Is that okay? Yeah. Cool. All right, so again, the upshot of this is that twister theory gives you a nonlinear description of vacuum self-dual gravity. Uh, how would you do this in practice? So the way Penrose uh, proved this theorem, constructed this theorem, is that you construct the deformed twister space by patching together open sets of the flat twister space. So uh, let's do that. So we can take two, two open sets, say, um, corresponding to when one, the other, the lambda coordinates on the flat twister space don't vanish. I guess technically this should be a twiddle on this lambda one here. Right. And so the idea is we want to patch, uh, patch these guys together on their intersection. Uh, so when both lambda zero and lambda one are non-vanishing. We know some things uh, that, that, that are going to help us to do this. The first is that we have to preserve the vibration for CP1. And because in this vibration, the thing that acts as the homogeneous coordinates on the base on CP1 are the lambda coordinates or lambda twiddle coordinates on twister space itself. That just means that we can identify the tilted lambda coordinates with the untilted ones. There's only one CP1 that's the base of the vibration, in other words. And what we're really doing is lifting the two co open coordinate patches on CP1 up to twister space. That's what we're doing. So then what we have to do is worry about how to patch together these mu coordinates, mu and mu twiddle. And what Penrose realizes is that there's an implicit way to do this, just specifying a homogeneous function on twister space of weight two. What I mean by that is that if I took all of the arguments of this function and I scaled them by a complex number r, so I took g and I wrote g as a function of r lambda alpha times r mu zero dot times r mu twiddle one dot, that would be equal to this g times a factor of r squared. So it's just in the usual sense of homogeneous functions. And then the point is that this homogeneous function generates canonical transformations. Um, on mu uh, alpha dot. So I can then define mu one dot in terms of one derivative of this generating function and mu twiddle zero dot in terms of another. It's an easy exercise. You can convince yourself to plug these things back into that uh, 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 Poisson structure, this Poisson structure, and see that it's preserved. Okay, so the picture geometric picture of what we're doing is we have these two uh, kind of open subsets of the flat twister space, u and u twiddle. We're gluing them together on their overlap over CP1, where we still have this projection. And the, the only remaining requirement is that uh, we preserve the Poisson structure on this overlap. The upshot is that you can do this just by specifying a, a homogeneous weight two function p. So upshot, again, if, if the details are sort of not making sense to you, the upshot is that if you hand me a weight to a uh, homogeneous function on twister space, you will get back a self-dual vacuum four manifold. Right? That's, the, that's the content of Penrose's theorem. And vice versa. If you hand me a self-dual vacuum metric in four dimensions, I can construct for you a G, uh, a weight to homogeneous function on twister space. And <clears throat> in point of fact, if we're being completely honest, this G isn't uniquely defined. It's defined up to some equivalences, which means that it's actually a cohomology, what's called a cohomology class, a check cohomology class on the flat twister space. This notation, so whenever you see a curly O in some number, it's just shorthand for saying homogeneous of weight two or homogeneous of that 
that number. So the technical definition of this would be that G makes sense on overlaps of two open sets uh, on twister space and obeys a consistency condition on triple overlaps, which is a kind of sheaf theoretic consistency condition. And it cannot be written in terms of differences of functions that only make sense on a single overlap. So that's, I mean, if you know Czech cohomology, then this is something I guess that you have uh, seared into your soul. But if not, all, all this really means is that G is a function. In fact, it's an equivalence class of functions uh, on Twister space. But the point is, you give me any representative in this equivalence class, you'll get the same self-dual vacuum four manifold. And equivalently, if you hand me a self-dual vacuum four manifold, I'll be able to construct weight to homogeneous weight two function or, or one of its equivalent, uh, one of its other representatives in the same equivalence class on Twister space. Okay, so what is, wh wh why are we talking about this? What, 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 what does this matter? So uh, we're interested in positive helicity soft gravitons, right? These are the things that were supposed to give us W1 plus infinity, um, according to the celestial holographers. And those things, a, a, a soft graviton, you could just think of it as, as an infinite, infinitesimal deformation of the gravitational field. So positive helicity soft, soft gravitons, that's the same thing as infinitesimal deformations of the self-dual sector of gravity. But then I just run that statement through uh, the, the, the nonlinear graviton theorem. That corresponds to infinitesimal deformations of twister space, of the complex structure on twister space. And thing is that these guys have to preserve all these structures on twister space. In particular, have to preserve Poisson structure uh, on the, the, the kind of fibers of twister space over CP1. So kind of in words, what this is telling us is that positive helicity soft gravitons correspond to Lie algebra of Poisson preserving diffeomorphisms on, on, on twister space. So those are words. Let's try and make them precise. What we mean is that we want to consider infinitesimal deformations of this function, this weight two function g, which I'll call little g. And these guys have to be homogeneous of degree plus two in order for that equation to make sense. They also need to be well-defined on the overlap of the two open sets that we glued together to make the curved twister space. And that condition means that they have to be polynomial in the mu alpha dot coordinates. Uh, because if they weren't, then you would pick up anti-holomorphicities when you went to the tilted coordinate patch and vice versa. Because uh, the, the base of twister space, the CP1, uh, is the same in both coordinate patches, it can be Laurent series in lambda. You don't need to be uh, kind of holomorphic in lambda. So, uh, okay, so the, the, the question of considering, if you like, a basis of positive helicity soft gravitons in twister space is just, considering a mode expansion, such functions, things that are polynomial in mu alpha dot and Laurent in lambda alpha. And it's pretty easy uh, to, to write down what this means. In, mural, in real money, this means that you can expand this function G modes of this form. So the numerator, I have things that are polynomials in mu of weight P plus M minus one, say in mu, in one component of mu, and weight p minus m minus one in the other component. I'll use some suggestive shorthand notation and call these w, p, m. Then just a generic Laurent series in lambda, which I decompose in the following, again, suggestive way. So here r can be any integer, because these guys can have any power in lambda. Um, then we need this guy to be, uh, again, polynomial in the mu's. And it has to be of weight two, homogeneous of weight two. And that puts uh, further restrictions on the other two indices, the P and the M. So 2P minus two has to be a non-negative integer. And the absolute value of M has to be less than or equal to P minus one, okay? So it's, again, easy to convince yourself. You can just do a counting argument here that this object, these G P M Rs um, are weight two in twister space. They're valued in O2 uh, in this shorthand notation. And they're well-defined on the intersection of the two, the overlap of the two open patches that we glued together. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, please. It's just a, a silly question. 
so this parameterization of the modes in terms of P, M, and R, was this inspired by something that already exists in the literature, or did you just uh, like do trial and error and figure out? That this um. Is so, so yeah, yeah. It's inspired by the fact that we want to get something. We want to see W one plus infinity, but uh, you could pick any parameterization. And in the end, you would get the, I mean, there is only one algebra of these things, as, as you'll see. So you could pick any parameterization, and then it would be just be some relabeling of that parameterization would take you to this one. But this is um, but, but yeah, in some sense, this was this was because we knew what we were looking for. I think, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So, so it's very easy to take the polynomials in mu, right, these, these WPM guys, and throw them into the Poisson bracket on twister space, right? This is just derivatives in mu. So it's very easy to work out what this commutator is. And lo and behold, you get precisely, precisely commutators of, I wrote down earlier for this little W1 plus infinity algebra. Uh, now really this, this isn't the whole algebra, this is what's called a wedge algebra. And that's just coming from this, this constraint on M. Um, so really, this is the wedge algebra of W1 plus infinity. But all, all of these things were also in Strominger's construction. He maybe just didn't make them super, uh, super explicit. And I should say also, if you're sort of wondering, well, why the heck do they call this thing little w1 plus infinity? Why not just w infinity? One on here, just the fact that you include the central element in the algebra. So in particular, the w10 uh, element, uh, you include it in here. So. That's, that's all that this notation means. It took me a while. I mean, if you're new to, if you've not worked with these W algebras before, it can seem like the Wild West, or at least it seemed like the Wild West to me. But but actually, everything makes sense as, as well as us. Um, but okay, so these are just the numerators <laughs> of these modes uh, that we're working with. What about the denominators? Well, because the Poisson bracket acts trivially on the lambdas, it's easy. Uh, you know, it's so considered on twister space, the Poisson brackets are degenerate, as we've been saying. So it's very easy again to work out the action on the full modes. Again, you get essentially the same commutators, the same structure constants. They don't see these R and S indices, which are telling you the weights in lambda, just add up in, in the commutation. So these are the commutation relations for loop algebra, W plus infinity. And really, it's the complexified loop algebra because lambda is let the lambda alphas are homogeneous coordinates on CP1. If you wanted to get the real loop algebra, uh, you'd consider a reality condition uh, on these. So, so for instance, you could go to the patch on the Riemann sphere where lambda zero is equal to one, and then the real loop algebra would be given by setting the absolute value of lambda one equal to one. So the, uh, the upshot of all of this is that just using the, this basic structure in twister theory of the nonlinear graviton, you find that infinitesimal deformations of the self dual sector of gravity, these are just Lie algebras, uh, the Lie algebra of Poisson diffeomorphisms on the twister space. And because the Poisson structure is degenerate, it doesn't see the lambdas, that really means that what you're considering is the loop algebra of Poisson diffeomorphisms on the mu alpha dot plane. But then you can just go back to these, these theorems of uh, Hoppe and Bacchus, who told us that W1 plus infinity is precisely that loop algebra you know, back in the 80s. So the upshot is that the algebra of positive helicity soft gravitons has to be loop algebra of W1 plus infinity, um, sort of canonically in some sense. So in other words, at least this, this is the way that I, uh, I, I interpret this story. In other words, it's not actually surprising that w, uh, LW1 plus infinity uh, arises in the soft self dual sector of gravity if you know the right things. So if you drank the twister theory Kool-Aid, uh, then in some sense, this, this isn't a surprising story at all. You can go, you can go back to Penrose's original paper uh, in 1976 and look at the last section, section six, and you can see these ideas there. He doesn't you know, he doesn't do this labeling of modes uh, that we have here. Um, it's all there. So, so really, in some sense, it's not that surprising. So, uh, okay, so if that was just the punchline of the talk today, I think that would be a little bit disappointing. So my claim is that, in some sense, Penrose basically explained to us why W1 plus infinity had to arise in the context of what we today would call positive felicity soft gravitons all the way back in 1976. But 
It doesn't explain how to obtain the action of W1 plus infinity on the non-soft sector or sectors of general relativity, or indeed how to link this story with kind of a dynamical theory that would allow you to say compute scattering amplitudes uh, of, of gravity, for instance. So uh, I think this is a really cute story uh, that like I say, in some sense has been there, sitting there, uh, just waiting for, for, for people to realize it um, for decades. It still doesn't, Still doesn't answer kind of other the other natural questions that we have about this this little w one plus infinity algebra. So uh, so can we answer those questions again using using twister theory? Sorry, so of course, uh, please. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so I, I was just missing the link between the. Uh, I mean, you showed uh, why the W one plus infinity is very natural in in twister space in terms of these infinitesimal deformations, uh, and uh, I'm just missing the link from uh, the uh, the the twister space representation of the uh, soft gravitons to these melon amplitudes for the soft gravitons. Uh, can you say? Indeed. Yeah. Yeah, so, 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 so great question. So um, I think there, I'm gonna give you two answers and you can decide if I've sufficiently answered, answered your question. Um, in the first instance, what, what this is about is, this isn't anything about amplitudes yet. This is just a, a story about uh, free fields, if, if you like. So <clears throat> the link, which I'm, okay, and I haven't told you this, is that if you give me one of these Gs, one of these nodes on Twister space, there's a, a, a crank I can turn that has a name, it's called the Penrose transform, but I can throw this little G into that crank, turn it, and I will get out a space-time field. And you can show that that space-time field is precisely what, uh, the celestial holography community would call a conformally soft graviton. So it's very easy to make this con connection between these modes on twister space, the conformally, the positive helicity conformal soft modes on space time. That's something you can do completely explicitly. Okay. It, here I've kind of motivated it more, more heuristically just by saying, well, these things correspond to infinitesimal deformations of the self dual sector. And that's what you must mean by positive helicity uh, soft gravitons, but you can be very explicit about that. In terms of amplitudes, I haven't said anything about that yet. Uh, so you, you're correct to be confused uh, about that. I haven't said anything about that yet. Yeah, and in particular, why is it? Why does it act very naturally on this melon representation? Uh, ah, that? well, okay. I guess what what twister theory is saying is that, in some sense, it it doesn't have to be the melon representation. <laughs> it right. could be it could be any representation is going to in some sense carry this action. Uh, but of, there's of a kind w of a linear, uh, sorry, um, no, the, the, the melon seems to make it more transparent. There seems to be a linear, a linear realization of this. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. And there, the, we'll, we'll, we'll see more about that later. One, one reason uh, why that's true, because we, we want to write these guys as polynomials in mu, very roughly speaking. Uh, again, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm not lying to you here, but I'm, I'm glossing over a lot of details. Very roughly speaking, if you wanted to write representatives for momentum eigenstates on twister space, they would go like exponentials in mu, right? So they're sort of nonlinear objects in mu. Whereas conformal primary wave functions on twister space are rational functions of mu. So that means it's just much easier to extract modes like this from the conformal primary representation. Than it would be from say, a momentum eigenstate representation. But it doesn't mean it can't be done. <laughs> uh, so sorry, uh, the first thing that you said was that in position space or in, uh, sorry, in usual momentum space, they would be exponential in mu. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, OK, uh, that's because of the Penrose transform. Uh, Absolutely. So again, uh, uh, and I'm not being fair to you because I've not shown you any equations to, to back up what right, I'm saying. So I'm just asking you to take my word for it. But yeah, the yeah. Penrose transform of a momentum eigenstate on space time yeah, looks yeah. like something that's like e to the mu exactly. on twister space, very okay. roughly speaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. and, but for the conformal primary nodes, I will show you explicit expressions later uh, that hopefully will help give, give some okay. intuition for this. Great. Is that okay? Yeah, that's good. It's a great question. Yeah. yeah. And not a fair answer on my part. Okay. Uh, before you move on, I just want to uh, like um, 
put things in perspective. So suppose we look at helicity one or uh, this O1 uh, objects and turn the mm -hmm. crank. Uh, do we get soft photons? And ah, okay. So so hey, so so, so the, the 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 qualitative answer to what you've asked is absolutely yes. It turns out that on Twister Space to get soft photons, it's not actually O1 you consider, but O0. So O1 would actually correspond to soft new positive helicity neutrinos <laughs> but this is just some fact of the yoga of this penrose transform thing but yes there's absolutely a, a parallel story here for positive helicity soft photons or gluons and you would get again this infinite dimensional cat's moody algebra that strominger uh, and friends uh, ha ha have written down there i'm just focusing on the gravity case today but you're 100 right that there's there's a gauge theoretic version as well Is that okay? I see. Okay. Great. Yeah. Yes. So, and, and, and actually, let me let me just take a, a, a detour here to explain. So, okay, let, let, let me go a bit further and then come back to this. And I'll try. There's a way you can sort of see why it, why it has to be O zero and not O one for 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 positive helicity um, photons. But I'll come back to that in a second. Is, is that okay? Uh, sure. Uh, but this, uh, I thought the homogeneity of this function was the spin or the helicity of the. It the is, time. but it's it is. I mean, it's related. So roughly speaking, uh -huh. the helicity on space time. So if you have something that's valued in O of two oh, h right, minus right. two on Twister yeah. space, then that gives you something that's helicity h on space. Time. I see. Yes, yes, yes. So there's this factor of two that shift. kind of offsets yeah, yeah, everything. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Is that okay? Yes, yes. Okay. I, I have a question. Actually, Tim, Tim, can I ask a quick, quick, a small question? So I think this is related to what Rajesh was asking. So, uh, I mean, I guess you will say something about this, but you must have some anti self dual perturbation to make connection with the amplitudes, right? Because at least for tree level, all plus amplitude is zero. So to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, uh, unfortunately for you, I'm gonna. I, I will talk about this, but it's gonna yes. be at the very end and very heuristically. So, so okay. let's get there, and yeah, then thanks. if you're not satisfied, you can ask me. More. Okay, okay. Yeah, but of course you're right. Yeah. I have a small question. Please. So this uh, this W one plus infinity amplitudes in the method of Strominger, they were really looking at the uh, celestial CFT kind of picture right i mean they were they were this was an algebra of the ccft right yeah absolutely here, here you are deriving directly from the gravitons which is which is kind of the uh, i mean the original field from which the ccft is defined through the melin transform is that mm -hmm. right yeah so so the question is uh, how are they related in the sense that this graviton is initially it, it is supposed to be something in the four dimensional theory. So now you are projecting it onto the celestial sphere by the projection of uh, operation of the fiber bundle, whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then that that is giving rise to the. Ah, uh, okay. So, so, okay. You, you're asking a very good question. And again, in some sense, I've not, I've not well, in a very precise sense, I've not answered it yet. So, uh, I'm ho I think I will answer it more explicitly uh, later in the talk, but 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 just for now, there's this as, as you've correctly pointed out, there's this this Riemann sphere floating around everywhere in this twister correspondence, right? And it's tempting to identify that Riemann sphere with the celestial sphere, and in point of fact, you can. But then to identify the and this comes back to the the earlier question about identifying these modes with actual conformal conformally soft conformal primary wave functions. That requires being explicit about the choice of representatives you're using on Twister space. Um, and I, I think I will show you formally, which will make this explicit later, but uh, ask me the question again, if you're not satisfied in another, in another 10 minutes or so. Is that, is that okay? Okay, yeah. That's a good question though, yeah. Any, anything else at this point? Going once, going twice, sold, okay. So, so uh, okay, I mean, I've written these questions here, but in some sense, y'all have asked me uh, plenty of other obvious, uh, obvious questions that aren't uh, at least a priori uh, resolved by the story I've told you so far. So um, it turns out that to do this, it's actually 
better to use, or I think it's better to use a different perspective on how to construct these curved twister spaces. So the perspective we just used was the original one that Penrose used, which is basically a check cohomological patching argument. You take two flat patches, glue them together, and then you find things that are consistent on the, on the overlap. Instead, you could just work in what you might call a dull bow perspective, which is to view it, view the curved twister space as a complex structure deformation of the flat one. That just means that you take the complex structure, the flat twister space, which I'll call del bar, uh, and I deform it some finite amount. I'll call that thing nabla bar. This nabla bar is what you mean by the deformed complex structure. And the fact that this guy has to preserve the, uh, the, the Poisson structure and the vibration over uh, CP1 uh, just means that the deformation is essentially Hamiltonian. So, I mean, weighted differential form Hamiltonian. So what it's contro controlled by is a zero one form on twister space. So that is a, a one form on twister space whose one form part points in the anti-holomorphic directions of weight two. So we see this weight two condition uh, rearing, rearing its ugly head again. And this has to be not an almost complex structure, an honest complex structure. So in particular, this needs to be integrable. I guess in highfalutin language, you'd say it's noyen whose tensor has to vanish. In real money, what this means is that it just squares to zero. So nabla bar squared has to vanish. And you can easily see that's going to give you some PDE on this H. It's going to say that uh, P bar of H plus on bracket H with itself has to vanish. So uh, it turns out though that you can trivially solve this uh, integrability condition um, anytime the self dual space time you want to consider uh, is radiative. So all that means is that the, the, we, we say a space time is radiative if it's uniquely specified by some characteristic data, say at infinity, at null infinity. Um, and then it turns out that uh, this little h you give, it's not just a not one form, but it's a d bar closed, not d bar exact not one form, or it's a cohomology class, a Dolbo cohomology class on twister space. And when that's true, uh, this l bar condition is automatically vanished, uh, is automatically satisfied. So there's another condition, uh, which I've not been explicit about here, which is that the not one form part of h points along the CP1 base. That gets rid of the kind of nonlinear term in the uh, in the, uh, the nabla bar squared condition. It's not terribly important right now. So, so point is uh, really these radiative space times are in some sense the ones that are of interest for scattering amplitudes. So uh, again, this is getting back to this question of how does this actually relate to the Mellon amplitudes, the celestial amplitudes that I started this whole story with. And the point is that if I want to construct curved twister space in this language, all I need to do is specify some Dolbo cohomology class on the flat twister space, and that will do it for me. So again, I'm being a little bit sketchy here, but nothing that I've told you uh, is, is a lie. <laughs> let's, let's put it that way. So, um, okay, so, so then the upshot of uh, what you can use as this nonlinear graviton construction to show in this framework, that points your self-dual space time these correspond to holomorphic rational curves that I'll call big X in uh, your curved twister space. But now when I say holomorphic, these, these twister curves are gonna be holomorphic with respect to the deformed complex structure, nabla bar. So we can parameterize these things in terms of homogeneous maps of degree minus one. So you might say, Tim, why are, why are you talking about negative degree uh, homogeneous maps? And the reason for that is because it completely fixes the moduli uh, of the map with some boundary conditions. Let me, again, show you what I mean by this in real money. Um, so let's take uh, the Riemann sphere, CP1, and let's put, uh, so now this, this Riemann sphere is an abstract Riemann sphere. It's the, um, where, where this map is gonna go from, into, it parameterizes the rational curve. And we're gonna give it some, homogeneous coordinates, sigma a, put a bold face a for the index here, just so we don't get confused with other SL2 uh, indices. And the lambda part of the map is gonna be trivial. And that's just because we preserve the vibration uh, to the CP1 in twister space that's parameterized by these lambdas. So nothing interesting can kind of happen here. Only interesting stuff that happens is for the mu alpha dot part of the map. 
And the boundary conditions I specify basically say that I get two simple poles at the north and the south pole of the Riemann sphere. And then uh, some kind of, you could think of it as like a non-zero mode part of the map, which I'll call the M alpha dot. So again, let's, let's unpack what this actually means. These numerators Z alpha dot and Z twiddle alpha dot, that's two plus two, four complex numbers. These guys are the moduli of the holomorphic map. They also act as local coordinates on the self-dual uh, manifold on space-time. So there's some, there's some nice mathematics here that I've completely glossed over, which is that there are, you're guaranteed that there are only four of these moduli, and that's the theorems of Codera from many, many moons ago. And this kind of remaining piece, this non-zero mode piece of the map, uh, this is just some smooth section of O minus one, which means it doesn't, O minus one has no uh, global zero modes uh, on, on Riemann sphere. So there's no new moduli introduced by this M alpha dot. It's completely determined by the holomorphicity condition with respect to the complex structure on twister space. And that just turns into a PDE for this M alpha dot. It means that the P bar operator on the Riemann sphere, so I put a sigma subscript here to remind you that this is, D bar with respect to the sigma variables acting on M alpha dot has to be given by a mu derivative of this Hamiltonian object H uh, that defined the complex structure on twister space. So in other words, oh, please go ahead. So this mu alpha is related to the lambda alpha through the twister transform as before or your... This, this mu alpha is... So the coordinates on twister space are still mu alpha dot lambda alpha. What we now want to do is parameterize holomorphic curves in twister space that correspond to points in the self-dual space time. So in Minkowski space, those were just straight lines. They were given by this incidence relation. So if I, if I covered up the M here uh, in the mu alpha dot equation, I can multiply both sides of this equation by sigma zero, sigma one, because this is a homogeneous equation, and same over here uh, with the lambda alpha coordinates. And then what you would get over here is that lambda alpha was literally equal to sigma a. And then you would get here, you would just recover the flat space incidence relation. So, so what we're doing is we're forming the holomorphic curves in twister space by this additional term m alpha dot. That m alpha dot is controlled by this differential equation here. So again, if I was in the flat twister space, that means turning this h off. Then I'm just saying that I have a holomorphic section of O minus one are no holomorphic sections of negative weight. There are no holomorphic functions of negative weight on the Riemann sphere. Uh, so, so in Minkowski space, this term isn't here. Uh, sorry, I think I'm, I'm giving a really long-winded answer to what was maybe a simple question. Have I, have I answered your question? No, I, I would guess that this X alpha alpha, I mean, the, 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 the metric and the X alpha alpha somehow getting mixed in some way because the X alpha alpha is just the coordinates, whereas the H is kind of the metric, right? Absolutely. So, so I haven't told you anything about the metric uh, on self dual space time yet. That metric is recovered essentially looking at intersections of these holomorphic curves, right? So there's you can deduce from the non the structure of the nonlinear graviton theorem that I wrote before that these curves intersect in twister space if and only if the corresponding points in the self dual four manifold are null separated. So that fixes for you a conformal class of metric on the self dual four manifold, and then it turns out that the vibration over P one and the degenerate Poisson structure on twister space fix a unique representative within that conformal class. So, so you need to know these holomorphic curves to determine metric uh, on space-time. It's an indirect argument. So H is supposed to be just a deformation of the uh, Riemann, Riemann sphere or something. Is that right? Uh, no, no. H, you should think, okay, so H, this little H, maybe this was bad notation. This little H lives in twister space. It's a deformation of the complex structure on twister space. What it corresponds to on space-time is a deformation of the Minkowski metric to some self-dual vacuum metric. Okay. Cool. And in twister space, this is reflected by taking those twister lines that we had in Minkowski space and deforming them to holomorphic curves. 
And again, it's that it's the H that controls that deformation. That's the content of this this last equation here. Did it answer? And I mean, I'm a, conscious it's probably not a good answer to your question, but does does it answer at least partly your question? Yeah, partly. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Cool. Like I said, keep keep interrupting me if it, if if things are not becoming clearer as we uh, as we proceed. Okay. So in other words, we have these holomorphic curves in twister space, which are specified by this equation. It turns out that there's an action for these curves. Uh, so this this equation is the Euler-Lagrange equation, something that you might call a chiral sigma model. So governing maps from the Riemann sphere. Uh, to twister space of the following form. So I just write down some kinetic term by contracting on the alpha dot first order chiral kinetic term by contracting on the alpha dot indices of M. That's what these square brackets mean. And then the kind of interaction term is just given by the deformation H. And then you have to wedge against a holomorphic one form, weight two to make, to make sense. Luckily, there's a canonical such object. It's just the thing that trivializes the canonical bundle of the, of the Riemann sphere. If those words make any sense to you. Otherwise, if you were just in the affine patch, it would just be D sigma. So it's not a regular D sigma, not big D sigma. Okay, so who cares? All right, so I've told you this story about holomorphic curves uh, in twister space. And I've said, oh, these things are actually, you can write down an action, a kind of twister sigma model action for these things. Why, who cares? What does this have anything to do with the questions we were hoping to answer about W infinity? Well, it turns out that there's a direct link between this twister sigma model and the self-dual, or uh, I got a question about this earlier, if you really want to think about it properly, the hyper Kähler geometry on, on the space-time. So you can prove the following lemma, that there's, there's a scalar you can construct, a space-time scalar, which is just given by kind of flat space piece. Plus the interesting part of the scalar is just given by evaluating the action for these holomorphic curves on shell. That should be a capital M, sorry, uh, on shell. And the, the, the theorem is that this object, this omega, is actually the Kähler potential for the self-dual metric on space-time. What I mean by that is given this omega, if I take two derivatives of it, once with respect to Z and once with respect to Z twiddle, I can construct a Feuerbein on space-time, tetrad on space-time, and you can show that this, this matrix, this two by two matrix, omega alpha dot beta dot, uh, has a fixed terminant, terminant two, and that will guarantee this tetrad is self-dual back in flat. Okay. So uh, these latter part of this, uh, so the, the fact that such an omega obeying this equation determines vacuum self-dual four manifold. That's a very old story that goes back to Plavansky. So um, the ancients would have called this scalar uh, the first Plavansky form of the self-dual four manifold. The real meat here is that this thing is computed for you by the action for the holomorphic curves on twister space. So that's the new, new observation. Okay, so the upshot is that I want to talk about positive helicity gravitons. So are things that deformations of the self-dual sector uh, of, of gravity, these are just like vertex operators in the classical sigma model defined by this action. So vertex operators, these are just small deformations of the action, and they're just given by integral over CP1 times a kind of twister wave function, which is just this H deformation on twister space. So the upshot of this whole story about holomorphic curves I've been giving you is that you can take this twister sigma model, this chiral sigma model for the holomorphic curves on twister space, and this guy describes literally in the sense of this Kähler scalar, uh, this Kähler potential, um, describes literally the self-dual geometry on space-time. And by taking perturbations of the sigma model action, you get perturbations of the self-dual geometry, self-dual perturbations. So in other words, these vertex operators, you should think of as representing positive helicity gravitons. Um, in this twister sigma model. And the data is given by these kind of twister wave functions, H, little h. So, okay, so I've told you this story, which was very much based on deforming complex structures and holomorphic curves. How does this line up with the patching function story that we had earlier? And I mean, if you know these sorts of things, then um, the, the, the alignment is, uh, what must be happening is obvious. It's just this isomorphism between Czech and Dolbo 
cohomologies, but it's very, very easy to see how this is working for the specific case of conformal primary gravitons in Minkowski space, which in some sense is the case of interest, our uh, most interest for the celestial holography story. So I told you before that there was this crank called the Penrose transform, which was if you gave me a little g, I would construct for you um, a positive helicity graviton on space-time. And it works not just for little g's, but for little h's as well. So there's a Czech and a Dolbo version of this thing. And it's very easy to write down the things you need to have on twister space to give you, let me go all the way back to the beginning here. Where did I write this down? This h here on space time. So what we're trying to do here, this metric perturbation, is write down representatives on twister space that will give you a metric perturbation of this form on space time. If I was smart, I would have repeated that expression here rather than uh, having to blast the whole way back through to the talk. But anyway, in the, in the kind of patching function representation, then you have to write down on twister space is this. You see again this residual gauge freedom in a choice of some constant spinner iota. And in a dull bow framework, you have something that's similar, except now you have what we often call holomorphic delta functions. This is really just kind of D bar of the Cauchy kernel on the Riemann sphere with some homogeneity factors. So when I write delta bar with some subscript, this is just holomorphic delta function carries homogeneity weight of that subscript in lambda, say. So it's easy to show that this little g is a Czech cohomology class that's homogeneous of weight two uh, on Mr. Space, and that this little h is a Dolbo cohomology class that's homogeneous of weight two on Twister Space. And now I just want to come back really quickly to a, a good question I was asked earlier about new dependence of the reps, uh, the representatives on Twister Space. See here, these guys are rational functions of mu. Um, if you were to do the same exercise for momentum eigenstates, you would get exponentials. So that's that's in kind of real money what 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 I was talking about uh, when I was waving my hands earlier. So, okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so uh, when you expand these g's in in terms of the modes, would you get back the kind of uh, expressions that you were getting earlier? You're one step ahead of me. You, you absolutely will. Okay. okay. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. On the nose. That's the punchline in, in some sense. Yeah. So now let me let me explain. Uh, can, at least. can I ask a, a small question? So the, please, yeah. From the conformal perspective, delta equal to one was the leading of graviton, and then you had to go down on the uh, axis, right? So here it looks like even like you know positive integral deltas may be okay as modes, but they don't do they have any interpretation as some? I mean, you know. Uh, Yes, yeah, so, so so positive integer delta is generically okay, even even in the space time version of the story. It's I only see. at delta equals two and down that things start getting weird. But all the normalizable modes there were delta equal to one plus ir in four dimensions, right? So yeah, yeah. So so the, the the normalizable modes. I mean, that's that's a complete normalizable okay, basis. Okay, 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 right. Yeah. Right, but but yeah. So so the, the, you know you you expect. Kind of singular things to be a discrete series, not a not a continuous one. But but the point is that these representatives will solve the relevant equation of motion for any value of okay, delta. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Does does that does that answer yeah, your yeah, question? Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. Okay. Right. So um, it's easy to see that this these G and H's, as I said before, their their relation is just really the Czech Dobol isomorphism. The level of vertex operators in our Mr. Sigma model, um, it's very easy to see how this works. So, so I said before the vertex operator associated to um, some little, some Dolbo little h on twister space is just given by integrating over CP1 with a holomorphic uh, one form on the CP1. It's very easy to see that if you using these two representatives, they're just related by contour integration, uh, where the contour is just a small circle on the Riemann sphere around uh, essentially where angle where, where, where lambda becomes equal to z right so all this really means is that uh you go from the dolbo to the check representative you just uh you just use cauchy's theorem that's 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 all it's saying but the basic idea is that the check representatives you can think of these as charges in the uh in the sigma model for the g's that i've written down that have support 
the fiber of twister space where lambda is equal to z. So now, you know, in these representatives, z and z bar, these are fixed for you. They're, they're a point on the celestial sphere that's going to correspond to the insertion point on the celestial sphere of the conformal primary graviton. Um, so the idea is now, precisely uh, as was observed before, it, it, it plug in here, not just any old G, but the conformally soft Gs, the mode expansion we wrote down earlier, and get, then that should correspond to soft charges in the, the twister sigma model. So uh, how do we define these soft gravitons in twister space? Well, again, like we were just talking about, the soft gravitons correspond to really to negative integers, um, integer powers of the formal dimension to melt delta and a few positive integers. And we define the twister representatives just by taking the residue of the general representative at, this, at these special values delta. And it's very easy to do that for these Dolbo representatives. So, okay, already, you know, your, your, your spidey senses should be tingling. These things are polynomial in mu, right? And the reason why they're polynomial is because of the range that K is allowed to take. Then they have some, again, delta function support where lambda coincides uh, with Z on celestial sphere. Now, um, you can then expand this soft representative in powers of Z bar and also just do an easy relabeling. So instead of working with K, which is literally the, the soft dimension, we just relabel this by K going to four minus two P. And then we get these soft modes or indexed by four minus two P. And we have a sum uh, running between the absolute values of P minus one. And here P is restricted to be a non-negative integer just by this re nature of this, this relabeling and the range that K is allowed to take. So here's the first, so, so when, when kind of conventional celestial holography, it's crazy that one could use such a word for this field, but uh, when conventional, i.e. Harvard based uh, celestial holography people do this, these factorial terms, these are the sorts of things that sort of, as far as I can tell, wind up being shuffled in by hand. There's nothing wrong with doing it because the modes will still solve the correct equation of motion. You're just normalizing them by some constants. Here in twister space, there's none of that. Like we get them on the nose, like all these combinatorial factors just come out um, completely cleanly. Not that that's like a great triumph or anything, but I, I think it's sort of a satisfying feature of the story. Um, so in other words, a basis of these positive helicity conformal soft gravitons is just given by the coefficients in that mode expansion. And so these are just, there's some numerical factor, holomorphic delta function of appropriate homogeneity. And then these W modes, which remember these are just polynomials in mu. We wrote down earlier. These are the exact same things we wrote down before. We feed this into the definition of the charges, of the, um, the, uh, the twister sigma model. We get what you might think of as positive helicity soft charges. So I mean, I've written, this is just literally transcribing uh, definition, first one. And then you can package these things into a kind of vertex operator algebra notation if that's something that uh, uh, resonates with you. But you don't need to pay attention to the second equality if it doesn't make sense. So, so, so Tim, for the appropriate choice of contour and for leading, subleading, is it same as M twister vertex operators for the... Ah, great question. Um, so, these vertex operators are not the same as ambitwister string vertex operators. Um, I see. Even for and, the dull, dull book, even for the dull book case. Even for the dull dough case. And so I'll say more about this at the very end, but but okay. um, the real reason is because this this twister sigma model is not a string theory. It's a, we treat it completely classically. Like that that theorem I showed you that relates the action of the sigma model to the the Kähler scalar for the space time. It's just a completely classical statement. So when we compute things in this twister sigma model and we're doing kind of world sheet OPEs, these aren't really world sheet OPEs. We're only taking tree graphs on, on the world sheet. Whereas in the ambi twister string, yeah. that's an honest to God string theory. And you don't worry about 
you know, tree or loop on the world sheet. You just do the whole correlation function. Yes. So, um, yeah, that's there's there's no like sense in which uh, these vertex operators are in some BRST cohomology. We right. just think of them as okay. infinitesimal deformations of the the sigma model action. Does that? It's not a yeah, it's yeah, not yeah, a precise yeah. answer to your question. Oh, no, no. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, no, they're very different, actually. Yeah. Here is understanding that the base, uh, the celestial sphere, is really the base of the fiber bundle, and the entire uh, entire uh, mister is the entire fiber bundle, right? Yeah. So that's that's sort of what's happening, and you and you can see it. That's a, that's a very good question. So you can see it in the structure of these contour integrals. So here, this contour, the small contour around this denominator vanishing. Right. And that's telling you to identify lambda, which is the coordinate on the kind of twister CP1, with Z, which is the coordinate on the celestial CP1. So um, that's what the structure of these kind of contour integrals is doing for you. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Good. Cool. Okay. So, uh, so now it's very easy to get the structure of the LW1 plus infinity algebra. Just using the kind of, again, this y'all are asking me all the right questions. Uh, this using kind of a semi-classical uh, OPE in the, the Twister Sigma model. So that Sigma model induces this kind of OPE for uh, mu alpha dot components of um, the Twister coordinates. And you can see already this, this has the structure of the Poisson algebra, uh, the, 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 the Poisson structure built into it. Um, and what we mean by semi-classical OPE is that we're only taking, uh, if we have two insertions, we're only going to take single contractions because we're not going to be interested in loops. Multi-contractions would, would, would be loops on, uh, on the underlying uh, CP1. So with this in mind, it's very easy to show that the kind of OPE between um, the, the modes reproduces for you uh, the loop algebra of u1 plus infinity. And that just means that these charges are just w1 plus infinity currents, which generate the Poisson diffeomorphisms on the lambda equals lambda equals point on celestial sphere fiber of twister space. And again, you guys have already asked me these questions. So I'm just I'm just repeating um, the answers that, that, that I've given you before. So, uh, okay, that's great. Um, so what? Uh, so now the point is that we should be able to use these charges to find the action of W infinity, one plus infinity, on gravitons that aren't soft by acting on vertex operators, generic vertex operators in the twister sigma model with this charge. Again, that's, that's a calculation uh, that's, that's straightforward to do. Um, so we're, we're, you know, okay, so the vertex operator is given by little h, it's Dolbo representative. And that's inside of a CP1 integral, but the rest of that isn't really interesting. The, the only interesting part is how the charge acts on the kind of twister wave function, if you like. And again, you can compute this using the semi-classical uh, world sheet OP. So again, that just means taking single contractions. And its first version, uh, at least the, the most naive version of this calculation, it just gives you directly that this has the structure of an OPE on the celestial sphere. So you get a simple pole in Z, which is kind of insertion point of the W infinity charge on the celestial sphere, minus ZI, which is the insertion point of the conformal primary encoded here. Then the coefficient of that that you get is just given by the Poisson bracket of the W infinity mode acting on the twister wave function. So this, this really gives you the action of the loop algebra in its canonical representation, that is with respect to the Poisson bracket uh, on twister space. So I don't think this is actually action that was written down in the celestial community, but in some sense, I think it's the most natural way to think, think about the action. But if you really wanna uh, match expressions that are in the literature, you can then mode expand its coefficient again in Z bar. And sure enough, I mean, this is just, Again, some exercise. Uh, sorry. Um, this is just some exercise. And what you find is this object. Now, that looks pretty complicated. There's some ratios of gamma functions. There's some binomial coefficients. You have this kind of descendant, anti-holomorphic descendant tower here. And then 
twister wave function with some shifted conformal weight, depending on where you are in the sum. Um, the upshot is that this matches the result for the action of soft on hard positive helicity gravitons that's in the literature. And previously this has been deduced just using asymptotic symmetries and collinear limits, but now we're getting it directly from a dynamical description of self-dual gravity. That is from this twister sigma model, which is a dynamical, uh, a dynamical object. So, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm over time. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up here, but just really briefly, uh, other things we can do, we can also get the action of W one plus infinity on the negative helicity sector of the theory. But to do this in the story that I've told you here today, we have to do it by hand. Because, because, and again, I already had a question <laughs> on this. There's no negative helicity information in this twister sigma model. It's kind of purely for the self dual sector of the theory. But what you can do, so by hand, what I mean is we just write down the twister representative for a negative helicity conformal primary graviton. And this is something you can do again, just using this machinery of the Penrose transform. And then you act on it with one of these, uh, one of these soft, these W infinity uh, charges and you get the right answer. But if you want to do that in a way that isn't by hand, what you really have to do is pass to this other theory, which is called an ambi twister string theory. And then we know how to get the action for both chiralities directly from, uh, from the world sheet theory. So that's a whole nother, uh, a whole nother story. Um, and, uh, but uh, the, so the reason you could say, well, Tim, why didn't you tell us that story? And maybe, maybe that is uh, what you're thinking. Uh, for me, that, that story from the kind of world sheet point of view is more robust because you have an honest string theory there and it's ambidextrous. You have both helicities in the game, but the relationship with the kind of classical origins of W one plus infinity is much less clear there. Whereas in this twister story, the fact that you wind up with W one plus infinity is actually not surprising at all. It's just built into the twister correspondence. But also using this ambi twister formalism, we can, we can also do the versions of this story for Yang Mills theory or even Einstein Yang Mills theory. And it's also uh, easy to get super space, space time supersymmetry in the game. That's something that Wei um, has written, written a paper about. So um, there's lots to do, lots to think about, um, but because I'm over time, I'll stop there and, and leave us some time for any more questions with already. So thanks very much. Let's thank Tim for a really wonderful talk. Thank you. Any questions? So, so Tim, just going back to the negative helicity, uh, I mean, if I wanted to think of the MHG amplitude story in this way, Right mm -hmm. now you're saying that there is no natural way to consider the uh, W infinity as the symmetry of the MHB amplitude. Okay, so so there is actually, but it's still, I mean, so so there is. So let me let me try and explain. So what you can do is you can start out just on space time and you can write down a generating functional for all of the MHV amplitudes. And that's a basis independent statement. Mm -hmm. And if you work hard enough, or actually if you don't work hard enough, <laughs> If you're, if you're sufficiently lazy, you can show that that generating functional, you have like a space-time integral and there's some integrand, but the real interesting thing in that generating functional is the, the Kähler scalar, this omega. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then there's also, the generating functional is, is ab initio bilinear in the negative helicity states because you want to compute yes. MHV yes. amplitudes. So in that sense, you've gotten the negative helicity stuff into the game already. And then to extract the MHV amplitudes, all you have to do is perturbatively expand that Kähler scalar. And the twister sigma model lets you do that very easily. And it's very easy to recover the known formulae for the gravitational MHV amplitude in that way. So that's, but the, also, old, that's the old Mason-Skinner uh, uh, formalism for the MHV, right? In terms of the twister, the one that they developed maybe 10 years, right? The... Ah, okay, yeah. So. <laughs> Man, okay, this is great. So yes, so so that picture was developed, yeah, long ago by Mason and Skinner. Yes. Um, and so that that picture of how to generate the kind of, yeah. So so in words heuristically, that's saying well, an MHV amplitude is really just a two point negative helicity amplitude on a exactly. self dual background, right? And then you kind of view the self dual background as like your cloud of positive helicity gravitons and you perturbatively explain blah, blah, blah. So that picture is true. Uh, but the there are two things. First of all, the generating functional that they wrote down back in 
yeah, 10, 10, 15 years ago, whatever, uh, is not manifestly gauge invariant. So it's not written in terms of this Kähler scalar. Mm -hmm. So you have to do some work on that, first of all. And then the other thing, this is not, a, <laughs> I mean, I love, I, lo I love that paper and I love these guys, so I'm not trying to trash them. But the way they do the perturbative expansion in that paper is wrong. <laughs> they get the right answer, but only because they're lucky. Um, the way they do the perturbative expansion isn't actually diffio invariant. So, um, so, so yes, it is an old story, but doing it the right way is actually a relatively new story. Um, but sorry, uh, does that does that answer your question? But, but so it can be done, you are saying, and then you would see the full W one plus infinity. Exactly. Okay, but thanks. that's yeah. special to MHV, right? Yeah. Because in MHV you get lucky, and you kind of only have to worry about the positive felicity graph. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. For for as you well know, for for, for generic uh, helicity configurations, not going to be the case. And for that, you really need the ambi twister string uh, to, to, to to help. Okay. You. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a nice question. Mm -hmm. So this celestial CFT is supposed to be ultimately a CFT, right? I mean, uh, when you really. Uh, if you, if you want to really establish a sort of duality between the bulk theory and the conformal field theory, the boundary theory, then you should find a kind of uh, conformal field theory which has the same algebra as what you are getting from the CCFT, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, so my question would be what sort of variables or what sort of theory would give rise to such a uh, CCFT with W infinity, one plus infinity algebra? Well, you know, so one answer, yeah, okay, so I don't know a good answer, right? I mean, if I did, uh, if I did, uh, you know, that would be front page news, right? So, uh, but one, one way you could, an unsatisfying answer <laughs> might be to say, well, you know, you could use this ambi twister string theory that, that encodes all of these actions of W one plus infinity. It computes the amplitudes for you correctly. And we've also shown that it computes the singular parts of generic celestial OPEs correctly. And we're working on showing that it computes the non-singular parts correctly as well. Um, so you could say, well, that would be something that answers your question, but in a very non-local way. It's like, it's like providing a world sheet description of the boundary CFT, right? I mean, it's not... It's not really what we're what the pipe dream. I think I th I, my opinion is that's not really the pipe dream that 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 Strominger and friends have have have, have put forward. But uh, well, okay. I mean, it's a lame answer to your question, but I don't really have anything more precise to say. Uh, but the ambi twister string uh, <coughs> is kind of. As you said, it was it was the it was kind of doubling the parallelity and the anti-parallelity sectors of what you had derived in, in this talk. Is that correct? That's right. So so yeah. I mean, but, but that, that doubling isn't terribly surprising because you know I set everything up here for negative felicity or self-duality. But you could have set it all up for uh, sorry for, for positive felicity and self-duality. You could have set it all up for negative felicity and anti-self-duality. And nothing would have changed except for a few signs here, here and there. So you know that you have one copy of W1 plus infinity for the self dual sector and another copy of W1 plus infinity for the anti self dual sector. That's not surprising. What the ambi twister string tells you is how these things talk to each other. Yeah, um, no, no, my question is like uh, the self dual sector, it's ultimately related to the gravity theory, right? Which is a, which is a bulk picture. Yes. Sense, right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the so the ambi twister string is in turn related to the bulk picture, in a certain sense. So yeah, uh, I mean, what ambi twister strings are are string theoretic descriptions of classical field theories in space time. No, that's correct. But you are getting the ambi twister string by just doubling the kind of analysis that you did for the self dual theory. No, that's not true. So yeah, so again, I was asked a question about this earlier. The ambi twister string isn't just squaring what happened here. It's much, much more than that. <clears throat> but 
But are you saying that the ambidextrous string is the CCFT is is analogous to the CCFT that you you, you expect or? Uh, no, I don't. I don't want to make any statements like that. that. Like, if you were a crazy optimist, that would be something you would say. <laughs> but I, I don't want to say such a thing. All right. Uh, are there any other questions for Tim? Okay, if not, uh, let's thank. Uh, thank uh, oh, sure. Yeah, go on. Sorry. Sir, how will the, sir, how, how will the Melvin transform of our, so sorry. Yes, the Melvin transform of Hawking radiation we calculated and the S matrix of vacuum if we have a black hole in the asymptotically flat space thing? It's a great question. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know the answer. I think I think you've touched on something that I personally I think is like a really unexplored this this whole celestial holography thing. If you look at the details of what people have actually studied, it's all perturbation theory around Minkowski space, or most of it is. But it's supposed to be a story about any asymptotically flat space time, in particular, a uh, asymptotically flat space time with a black hole in it. And no one has really talked about this at all. It's a very interesting question. I would love to know the answer. Thank you, sir. And so one more question, sir. Can we have this asymptotically flat space time in an ADS background? I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, if, if you have ADS, then you're not, if you have a cosmological constant turn on, you're not asymptotically flat. Um, but maybe you mean something something else, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I yes, I meant something, I, I didn't mean that exactly, but I, but I think I attended another talk where they said that if we have if you take astro, if you take astronomical distances, we can we can consider a space time as flat, and in cosmological distances, it might have some cosmological constant. I attended a talk regarding that. I'm I'm a little bit sure about it. Yeah, no. So so I mean that, that those statements are true, but from the perspective of conformal compactification, so we we, we view this story as living on the conformal boundary of the space time. And if you if you have a cosmological constant, <clears throat> the topology of that conformal boundary is different than if you don't. So it's like it's one of these things where it's like you can't be uh, a little bit pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. You're, you're you, you can't be a little bit not asymptotically flat. You're either asymptotically flat or, or you're not in this story. Um, but that doesn't contradict what 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 you were saying either. Maybe what you're saying is that uh, if you have ADS, you have a flat boundary. You have R four as a boundary of ADS five or something. Is that what you're saying? No, uh, the I mean, so let's just I mean, it, you know, let's take De Sitter versus Minkowski, right? The the conformal compactification of De Sitter is two spatial three spheres, right? The conformal compactification of Minkowski is two light cones and three points, roughly speaking. <laughs> so they're just completely different uh, uh, kind of kind of spaces. The the conformal boundaries. Thank you, sir. No problem. Okay. Uh, I guess we can uh, um, end the seminar here if there are no more questions. But let's th thank Tim again for a great seminar and for patiently answering all the questions. <laughs> you tried. Yeah. <laughs> <and after the talk. laughs> yeah. no, it was a pleasure. Thanks very much for the invitation. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. Yeah, bye.